Some general considerations on the philosophy and practice of magic now follow. The effectiveness of magic depends heavily on the skill and subtlety of those performing it and on the careful choice of and preparation for a desired effect. In general, one should try and bring about events which have a measurable probability of occurring by chance alone. And one should not be too proud to do everything possible on the physical plane to help it occur. Thus magic should be something thrown in to tip the scales of chance in one's favour when all possible physical action has been taken. By neglecting to maximise the probability on the physical plane, one sets up an internal conflict in which magic is expected to make up for poor preparation. Thus in divination, one should not shy away from first exhausting all mundane sources of information that might be relevant, and in enchantment, assist the spell both before and after casting by all possible ordinary means. The purpose of performing magic is not to test the efficacy of magic. If it is performed in this spirit of challenge, the subconscious challenge for it to fail will be the only result which manifests. Magic is to be performed to get results, and even if one at first achieves results only a little better than chance, then it at least provides an edge which can be turned into a considerable advantage if subtly employed. One should always look for an avenue of reasonable probability through which chance can be bent towards desire. For example, the probability of spontaneously materializing a substantial fortune is rather low. And even doubling that probability by magic is unlikely to lead to success. On the other hand, even a small advantage in gambling or business can produce a decisive effect. Similarly, divination should be regarded as a means of distinguishing the correct information from amongst those alternatives of which one is aware or able to imagine. In magical acts of illumination, it is better to conjure initially for modest, specific improvements or even arbitrary changes to oneself rather than for ill-defined or grandiose modifications. Although the law of magic is peppered with tales of really extreme and improbable events, remember that even the best of the Magi rarely pull off more than a dozen such events in a lifetime. The aspiring magician should seek to work on the simpler schemes first and to immerse himself in the belief structures of magic and the really great acts of power will gradually begin to manifest in his work. At any time in life, but most commonly in late youth, when we have the vague intuition that, is, that there is something profoundly bizarre and inconsistent about life, the universe and everything, there may suddenly be a horrifying or ecstatic certainty that one's own self is illusory and that reality is also an illusion. One's carefully defended identity seems to be a pointless pretense and an empty shell. The world becomes a cacophony of meaningless sensations. Most people will reject this initiation and manage to fill their lives and identities with sufficient concerns until perhaps an awareness of mortality reminds them of it again. Those who do drink the poison must seek stronger medicine or become sick or mad. Rational materialism is the least powerful of the antidotes. Little more than an assertion of the reality of the ego or self-image and the reality of physical objects. Yet it works for some, and if they pursue it rigorously, they may become that much more effective in philosophy and science for the serpent's kiss. However, it does impart a veiled destructiveness to these endeavors. Religion and mysticism offer a different form of medicine. Transcendentalism is the acceptance of the emptiness of self and the unreality of phenomena as symptoms of our temporary estrangement from some greater fullness and reality, be it nirvana, God or enlightenment. Those with a particularly te deep terror of extinction and nothingness become the most passionately religious and mystical, precisely because that negation is always with them. Finally, 
There are those brought close to death by the serpent's bite, and those who found in the poison itself a source of freedom and laughter. These are the potential magicians. Debilitating and depressive maladies with no obvious cause were recognized as a shaman sickness in the old hunter-gatherer societies. If the sufferer could rebuild his identity or spirits, and hence his bodily health, with or without help from other shaman, then he could become a shaman himself. In our own culture, there is too much symptom suppressive medicine, and there are too many subcultural identities available for this tradition to have survived. However, there are many who do become magicians after a struggle with illness, typically asthma, or after a struggle with the temptations of suicide. For some candidates, the serpent's bite is an ecstatic awakening, and they proceed directly to a purely magical answer without suffering. If the self is an elaborate pretense, and the world is without a fixed meaning, then one is free to be anybody and do anything. Such freedoms equip one well for the theatre or espionage, or if one has a taste for tampering with the fabric of illusion itself, magic. After the absurdity and eventual collapse of their empire and class system, the British have often only the most tenuous grip on any kind of credible identity. And it is unsurprising that such a high proportion of notable spies, actors and magicians should emerge from that race. Of course, there are many people who look to magic merely as a means of augmenting their lifestyle whilst retaining an essentially materialist or transcendental worldview. The materialist who dabbles in the occult is usually looking for something transcendental. He never finds it because no proof or refutation of parapsychology really implies anything at all about the existence or non-existence of anything transcendental. Transcendentalists who dabble in magic usually obtain results as spectacular as they are useless. Quite quickly they are surrounded by demons and spirits, powers and principalities, and notebooks full of outlandish visions and communications. Soon, they are alternating between excessive humility and megalomania. Those who approach magic from a, a materialist or transcendental point of view may succeed in getting a few magical effects, but only an acceptance of magic on its own terms is likely to confer the persistence to actually become a magician. Thus it is worth contrasting the magical paradigm with the rational and transcendental paradigms to see how they might usefully be untangled from each other. Although the paradigms are not mutually exclusive, they do not fit comfortably together. Yet of all people, the magician is the least likely to feel that they should be forced to fit, and the contemporary magician has most to profit from a working understanding of each. The materialist, transcendental and magical paradigms each recognize a different basis to reality. The materialist universe consists of matter and energy in space and time. The transcendentalist universe is created of spirit or consciousness. As there is no universally accepted word for the underlying reality of the universe in magical terms, I shall borrow and adapt the word mana. All magical systems are explicitly or implicitly structured around the recognition of mana in some guise or other. Mana cannot precisely be described in materialistic or transcendental terms, but as magical terms are rather limited in our culture, it is worth attempting these descriptions. Mana, in materialistic terms, is the information which structures matter and which all matter and thought is capable of emitting and receiving across space and perhaps time. Mana, in transcendental terms, is a sort of life force present to some degree in all beings, objects and events, and able to act between them. In magical terms, mana is the power which shapes phenomena, and which phenomena emit to shape other phenomena. It is also knowledge in the sense that the shaping power imparts information. Mana is not synonymous with consciousness in the transcendental sense. Consciousness is no more than a word used to describe the sensation arising from mental activity. Mana is analogous to spirit 
only to the extent that spirit is taken to imply communicated information. Mana is not an attribute of matter, rather it is the other way round. Matter is the way in which mana most commonly appears to us. The so-called scientific laws of the material universe are an expression of mana. From a magical point of view, the laws of nature are incomplete. Future events are not entirely determined in advance. Mana acts chaotically within those arbitrary limits it has already invented. Thus mana is creative and unpredictable in those situations where there are insufficient mana conventions to determine what will happen. And this includes everything more complex than clockwork. And it is here that magic or mana projection can be used to force the hand of chance. Divination must always be difficult or subject to large inaccuracies because many aspects of the future are indeterminate. The decision to develop one's psychic powers primarily for enchantment, which is making things happen, rather than for divination, is a large part of actually becoming a magician. At many points in its history, magic has been heavily contaminated with mystical and religious beliefs. The term chaos magic is used to designate a philosophy of pure magic, unadulterated with transcendentalism. There are two basic principles underlying it, and these give structure to the magician's identity. The first is that mana is spontaneously self-creative. Mana creates itself in the manifestation of phenomena and events, and having created arbitrarily, tends to stick to a pattern. Thus the universe is arbitrary within arbitrary limits. There are ultimately no reasons for the laws of the universe. They arise chaotically and take on the appearance of causality by repetition. Now these arbitrary limits are less confining than most people think. The sun will rise and water will still run downhill tomorrow, but much of what will happen is at this moment still undecided. For the magician, the core of the microcosm and macrocosm doctrine is that man and the universe are both based on the random, chaotically creative powers of mana and that both have considerable power to exercise that freedom. Thus, in the magical paradigm, there is no need to debate free will versus determinism. Any sufficiently complicated system will exhibit some random behavior and if we choose to identify with our random behavior and call it free will, then we, should not, then we should be prepared to affirm that the weather, for example, also has a degree of free will. All this soon leads the magician to the recognition that it is he who has effectively created much of his own universe by investing or withdrawing meaning or belief in various parts of the surrounding reality. This is likely to lead the magician, particularly the younger magician, into some fairly extreme forms of behavior as he tests his mana against that of the arbitrary conventions in the environment. A certain perversity, iconoclasm and antinomianism is likely to color his extreme individualism. He is as likely to experimentally deify some rough-hewn fetish as he is to desecrate what others hold sacred. To survive in this mode requires a considerable lightness of touch. A huge sense of humor is all that stands between the magician and social ostracism, ostracism or madness. He would be the first to proclaim that when the possibilities of common sense prove insufficient, one can often make nonsense deliver the goods. The second core principle of magic is also subsumed within the microcosm and macrocosm doctrine. Because mana penetrates everywhere, all parts reflect the whole and the magician is at least potentially in instantaneous two-way contact with all phenomena. In practice, a magical link is required. The magician must possess some image or memory or a connection to some material substance through which mana can operate. Mana operates between phenomena of similar type. Transmitter and receiver must share common characteristics. Like attracts like. 
The magician aims to establish certain symmetries between the inner and outer landscapes. Being aware that mana is playing a game with itself and making up the rules, prizes and forfeits as it goes along, he decides that it would be more fun if he were to cheat a little himself. To do this, he must first prepare his internal landscape. It is basically the great variety of methods of preparing the internal landscape which accounts for the rich diversity of magical identities and magical symbol systems. The practice of visualization is basic to them all, however. Visualization should also be understood to include intense ideation, sustained emotion, and other forms of mental focusing, concentration, and imagination. It is a state bordering on hysteria in the clinical sense, where the whole of the attention is directed towards some particular focus. It is usefully augmented by various physiological practices, ranging from sensory deprivation to frenzied ecstasy, that are collectively known as methods of attaining single-pointed awareness, or gnosis. The oldest magical systems, known as shamanism, populated the internal landscape with the spirits of natural phenomena, diseases, plants, and particularly animals, in an attempt to gain control over these phenomena. Nowadays, a number of neo-shaman practice identification with animal form, not so much for hunting purposes, but as a gateway to gnosis in which to perform other magics. In religious periods, magicians have usually filled their internal landscapes with angelic or demonic images. Each entity would have some specific function in the world, and each wizard would have a grimoire detailing the connections he had forged between the parts of his inner landscape, conceptualized as entities, and the outer landscape, the world. In their Baroque symbolism, both the shaman and the goetic, theurgic traditions reflect the fact that it is considerably easier to handle the internal landscape if one fills it up with spectacular and emotive artifacts. The continuing popularity of Satanism amongst agnostics is testimony enough to this. There is some reality to the tradition of demonic packs. Whatever is accepted into the internal landscape becomes part of you and will grow if fed. There is always a danger that design faults in an internal landscape lead to a progressive detachment from the external landscape. Then he who would be a magician ends up merely as an internal landscape gardener or mystic as he usually dignifies himself. Modern Kabbalah, in which I include the whole vast overflown edifice of correspondences between archaic pantheons, metals, plants, stones, tarot and astrology, can often be more of an obstruction than an aid to magic. Those who attempt to use the system in its entirety tend to be too preoccupied with patching incongruent maps to each other and to their experience of the outer landscape to actually do much effective magic. Partly as a reaction to such, to such stultifying systematization, and partly out of a desire to evolve a pure magic which is structuralist, eclectic, and free of transcendental contaminants, a freestyle tradition is developing. The principles behind the freestyle or chaos tradition are that there is usually plenty of material already in one's internal landscape, that deficiencies can be made good by blatant invention or theft of appealing symbols from any other system, and that all methods of gnosis are interchangeable. Nothing is sacred, unless one finds it is useful to regard it as so. The personal arcanum is a natural source for internal landscape material. Everyone will find themselves richly endowed with fears, terrors, lusts and desires if they look and what better material to manufacture gods and demons from is there? Past lives, explored or even invented in trance, dream or reverie, can also be a key to the worlds within us, as can work with atavisms, the backward exploration of genetic memory to tap the powers of beasts. To re-establish participation in natural phenomena, 
the magician may need to remythologize his internal landscape. It is easier to call down lightning or quell a sea storm via one's concept of Thor or Poseidon than it is by direct will alone. The reason for this, and indeed for the oblique nature of most spells in general, is that our unconscious is far better at magic than our conscious mind. Sigils, spell procedures and entity visualizations keep the conscious mind occupied with a complex tangential activity while sending a simple message, insulated from conscious interference, to the mighty subconscious. Some magicians find it expedient to create fetishes and visualizations of machine entities for psychic interaction with computers or complex and temperamental mechanical devices. The same principle applies to divination. The conscious mind is deliberately preoccupied with manipulating a net of symbols in which clairvoyant message from messages from the psychic subconscious can be caught. The subconscious is a highly imprecise term drawn from materialist psychology. Nothing is ever forgotten, but some things are more easily recalled than others. There is no serviceable magical equivalent because magicians never found such distinctions of this type useful. Nevertheless, the doctrine of the subconscious is a useful way of reminding the rationalist that there is more to him than his ego admits. As sunlight obscures the stars by day, so does wakefulness obscure the fact that we are still dreaming. Any serious exploration of the possibilities of the internal landscape should eventually force the magician into the materialization that he is more than a single being. The rational ego of materialist psychologies and the single soul or god of monotheist religions are merely tricks we have been taught to make us more predictable and controllable. The fact remains that when one is angry, lustful, terrified, in love or ten years older or younger than one is, one no longer is who one is at present. The magician, <coughs> who may at times experience himself as the horned god, a bear, an empty void, a spirit medium, or a businessman, should come to realize that there is no fundamental need for consistency. Once free of the illusion of self, he does not need to rationalize his activities into a consistent ego pattern, or order them into a spiritual unity. It must be said that many magicians, perhaps the majority, effectively abort their further development by making a disastrous mistake here. During his career, a magician will accrete various secondary identifications to match or balance his personality. Thus he may work in the magus teacher light charismatic mode or the joker initiator dark reclusive mode or a mixture of these. This will affect his tertiary identifications which are basically the lifestyle and symbolic system he chooses. The secondary and tertiary identifications are merely tools which the magician uses and not in themselves of any danger to the magician. A primary identification is made when the magician accepts some goal or power or ideal as absolute and outside of himself. In technical terms, this mistake is known as discovering one's holy guardian angel. The magician becomes a tool of his obsession. Beyond this point, the magician can make little progress. He has lost his fluidity because he has filled or obscured the creative, magical, chaotic void at the center of his self with a partial and artificial conception. In effect, he has simply become a transcendentalist or ideologue by a very roundabout route even if he still dabbles in magic. But for the true magician, nothing is true and everything is permitted, which is to say that all ultimate truths are lies and that anything he does is justified simply by his doing it. By accepting that he is a colonial being, the magician is able to unlock the wealth within. He whose name is Legion can do anything, and that is, of course, what the priests and politicians have always been afraid of.
This is a declassified third and fourth degree conjuration of the magical pact of the Illuminates of Thanateros. The pact is a chaos magic organization. Chaos magic is distinguished from other forms of magic by a number of principles and practices. Foremost amongst these is that an altered state of consciousness known as gnosis attained by meditative or ecstatic procedures is essential to magic. Secondly, that it is the unconscious rather than the conscious mind which affects magic. Thirdly, that belief is to be regarded as a technique rather than an end in itself. And fourthly, as a corollary of this, that systems of belief and symbolism should be chosen to suit the needs of the work in hand. Thus the chaos magician strives to enter that paradigm in which nothing is true and everything is permitted. The Thonos Rite is a tape-assisted operation of astral magic. Astral magic is a form of trans meditation in which magic is performed using artifacts of willed imagination rather than actual physical instruments. Thus, to perform astral magic, the magician forms the equipment he uses in his imagination by an effort of visualization. The Thonos Rite consists of a meditation journey through a series of underground chambers, hence the name Thonos, Thon meaning earth or cave. The visualizations given on the tape are moderately complex in order to draw the mind into a trance condition. The purpose of the rite is to provide a setting in which the magician can perform acts of magic in the various chambers. Such acts of magic are normally performed to create actual effects in the physical world or to retrieve knowledge psychically from the world. The visualizations given on the tape are accompanied by carefully devised sound effects designed to stimulate the right cerebral hemisphere of the brain. It is this part of the brain which is most involved in trance, meditation, visualization, creativity, inspiration and magic, as well as music. The meditation leads the magician through the visualization of six chambers, each dedicated to a particular magical activity. In five of the six chambers, the magician is left for a period of approximately four minutes to perform a specialized act of magic at will, whilst the tape delivers sound effects conducive to the working in hand. A brief description of the type of operations that may be conducted in each chamber now follows. When first using the Thonos Rite tape, it is best to listen to the meditation without actually performing it initially. Thus you will form an idea of how long each sequence takes and a familiarity with the sounds which accompany each part. Persons of an excessively nervous, paranoid or superstitious disposition are cautioned against the use of this tape and its creators accept no responsibility for accidents associated with its use. The Thonos Rite tape should not be used with a Walkman whilst in motion. The first chamber is for evocation. Evocation is magical work with entities. Entities are semi-sentient beings which are either created by the magician or in the case of pre-existing entities associated with other life forms such as plants and animals contacted by the magician. Although entities are not composed of physical substance they are conveniently handled by visualizing them in the shape of homuncular or bestial creatures. Entities are usually created or contacted so that they can be directed to make effects occur in the world or seek out knowledge for the magician. In the evocation chamber the magician reviews those entities he has used in the past dissolving or banishing those no longer required as well as creating or evoking new ones and directing them to their specified purposes. For the scientifically minded 
entities may be regarded as semi-independent parts of the magician's subconscious, which the consciousness exerts a degree of control over by visualizing them as actual creatures or beings. This belief does not limit their activities to the realm of psychology. The mind, and particularly the subconscious, is quite capable of interacting directly with reality by magic. In the case of pre-existing entities associated with other naturally occurring life forms, the act of contacting an entity may be regarded as establishing or awakening the entity's powers within the magician's subconscious. Alternatively, you may choose to retain the conventional hypothesis of spirits. The second chamber is for divination. Divination is the discovery of information otherwise unavailable by psychic means and implies such activities as passive telepathy and attempts to unravel aspects of the past or future. Having decided what he wishes to perceive, the magician awaits the formation of some image in his mind's eye. The magician may attempt direct prescience or he may prefer to summon an answer couched in terms of tarot or I Ching, I Ching images or some other form of symbolic language with which he is familiar. Experience has shown that it is preferable, where possible, to divine short and enchant long. Reality is stochastic and probabilistic rather than strictly causal and deterministic. Better results are obtained if one attempts to divine for events which are not too far off in time, past or future. However, when casting spells, it is better to enchant well in advance for one's chosen desires. Consider also that in performing divination, particularly for time-distant events, you may in effect be casting a degree of enchantment. You may actually be helping to create that which you imagine you are perceiving. This is the curse of prescience and the reason for which augurers of disaster were occasionally executed. Perceiving disaster, remember it has only a probability of being actualized and that probability can often be decreased by magical or mundane action. The third chamber is for enchantment. Enchantment is the creation of effects in the world using spells. A spell is a representation of what you want to happen, made into a form which does not directly remind the conscious mind of what it is you want. The reason for this is that conscious wishes are not particularly effective for reasons too complex to elucidate here. However, subconscious wishes are tremendously more effective. Thus, when designing a spell, the magician makes something that appears meaningless or nonsensical to his conscious mind, but which stimulates the real desire in his subconscious. For example, he may state his desire and then jumble up the syllables into a mantra or write out the desire and compound the desire into an incomprehensible sigil. Alternatively, the magician may make a pictorial or solid image and stylize it so heavily that it does not immediately suggest its purpose. In every case, the aim is to create something which the conscious mind can concentrate on without being reminded of the actual desire. At the same time, the subconscious will be stirred to act magically because the process of creating the spell is remembered by the subconscious and this connects with the actual desire. To cast the spell all that is required is that the magician concentrates on visualizing the spell with great intensity without thinking about the desire that it represents. Remember when using an image of a person for example in astral or other forms of magic that the image which is ritually healed or wounded or whatever, should not bear too much likeness to the target, although in the process of its construction, a subconscious link is established with the target. 
When ritually treating the image, the magician must concentrate only on the image without becoming conscious of whom it represents. In practice, the magician will usually create a spell image for use in the enchantment chamber before he begins the Thonos rite. The fourth chamber is for invocation. Invocation means union with some particular form of consciousness or psychic principle. The aim is to saturate the mind with a peculiar nexus of thought and power for inspiration, personal change and or magical action. Magicians traditionally chose the classical pagan deities for this purpose, as every cosmology embodies a complete spectrum of psychology. Thus, for example, the magician may invoke the qualities of Mars to increase his courage or warfare abilities in life, or to remedy some weakness in his physical vitality. Alternatively, on the magical level, he may invoke Mars to add extra power for the divination of enemy intent or the casting of an attack spell. Such secondary acts may also be performed in the invocation chamber after the main act of invocation. Briefly, invocation consists of the total immersion of consciousness in the qualities and attributes of that which one is invoking. Thus, for Mars, the magician would visualize himself in a warrior's outfit armed with weapons. He would visualize the sigil of Mars in flaming red and the chamber suffused with a crimson glow. He visualizes himself making martial gestures and tries to summon the emotions of battle fury and the elation of victory. The fifth chamber is the pit of Caronzon, the demon of dispersion. In the pit of Caronzon, the magician undergoes the experiences of disintegration and reintegration, or death and rebirth. It is useful, perhaps essential, that the magician periodically shatter and rebuild himself if he is to attain to that fluidity and freedom which mark the perfect magician. Nothing need be prepared in advance for the encounter with the pit, as the complete visualization sequence is given on the tape. The sixth chamber is the chamber of illumination. Illumination is a magical operation in which the magician carries out direct modifications upon himself or in which the magician seeks the knowledge or wisdom to modify himself. Thus, in acts of illumination, the magician either quests after the hidden wisdom that he contains or he casts a spell at himself to change himself. In practice, the magician usually enters the chamber having decided beforehand that he will either await some specified inspiration or with the intention of casting a spell at himself to remedy some weakness or to improve some quality. The Thonos Rite Meditation was written and narrated by Peter J. Carroll. For a further elucidation of the principles expounded on this tape, consult his book Libernal and Psychonaut. The Thonos Wright music and sound effects were written and created by Dan Sumter, assisted by Sam Wellborn. This tape is in the copyright of Peter J. Carroll and Dan Sumter. Begin the meditation sitting or lying in a comfortable position. Breathe deeply and evenly for a few moments to relax your mind and body. Let the Thonos working begin.
Over the clothes that you are wearing, a black hooded robe now appears. In front of you is a black cloth veil bearing the eight-rayed star of chaos in silver. Draw this veil to one side. Revealed before you is a wall of dark rock with a heavy oak door set into it. The door bears no lock or handle. In place of a keyhole, there is a large circular plate of gray metal. Visualize an upright pentagram onto the metal plate. The door swings slowly inward. Advance through the door into a rough-hewn rock passageway. The passageway slopes downwards as you continue. The walls are lit by a faint eerie glow from the rock itself. The passage levels out, and after a few more steps, you are standing between a pair of doors on either side of the passage. The doors are of a similar design to the first door. Turn to face the door on your left. This door bears a glowing yellow square. It is the Temple of Evocation. Visualize an upright pentagram onto the metal disc on the door. The door swings silently and slowly inwards. Enter the temple to find it lit by a glow from a central yellow altar in the form of a double cube. Any instruments that you may require will appear on this altar. The temple is a large cubic cavity in the rock and its walls and floors and ceilings are uniformly black. In this temple, Perform whatever acts of evocation you have willed.
prepare to leave the temple of evocation. As you pass out of the door, it closes behind you. Step across the passageway to stand before the other door. This door bears a glowing green crescent. It is the temple of divination. Visualize an upright pentagram onto the metal disc on the door. swing silently and slowly inwards. Enter the temple to find it lit by a greenish glow from a large crystal sphere supported on a bronze tripod. The temple is a cubic cavity with blank walls. In one corner is a box containing any instruments that you may require. In this temple perform whatever acts of divination you have willed.
to leave the Temple of Divination. As you pass out of the door, it closes behind you. Turn to your right and advance down the passageway. After a short distance, you are standing between another pair of doors. Turn to the door on your left. This door bears a glowing red triangle. It is the Temple of Enchantment. Visualize an upright pentagram onto the metal disc on the door. The door swings silently and slowly inwards. Enter the temple to find it lit by a red glow from a central altar. The altar is in an inverted pyramid with its apex embedded in the floor and its flat square base uppermost. Any instruments that you may require appear on the altar. The temple is a cubic ca cavity of grey rock with a circular aperture in the wall opposite the door. The aperture opens out to a limitless dark void. In this temple, perform whatever acts of enchantment you have willed.
to leave the Temple of Enchantment. As you pass out of the door, it closes behind you. Step across the passageway to stand before the other door. This door bears a glowing blue circle. It is the Temple of Invocation. Visualize an upright pentagram onto the metal disc on the door. The door swings silently and slowly inwards. Enter the temple to find it lit by a band of glowing white marble that makes a large circle on the floor. The temple is a cubic cavity of grey rock. Enter the circle and stand in its center. Any instruments that you may require will appear when commanded to do so whilst you remain in the circle. In this temple perform whatever acts of invocation you have willed. Thank you.
prepare to leave the temple of invocation. As you pass out of the door, it closes behind you. Turn to your right and continue along the passageway. A few steps ahead, there is a massive iron trapdoor set into the floor of the passageway. This is the pit of the demon Karonzon. As you approach, the trapdoor swings upward with the sound of strange eldritch machineries. beyond and reveals a smoking pit at your feet. You pick your way carefully down a steep and jagged tunnel. As you proceed, the air becomes hot and begins to stink of death. At last, you enter an irregular chamber strewn with rubble. Yellowish bones are scattered on the floor. A human figure confronts you. Its face is a grinning skull with shreds of withered flesh flaking from it. The figure is clothed in a black robe which is tattered and filthy. It extends a skeletal hand towards you. You take a pace back but the hideous creature advances upon you. As its withered hand snatches for your throat, you feel a sudden jolt. Instantly, the face of the apparition becomes your own face that you are looking at. The shock causes you to collapse. The figure disappears, but now you are disintegrating. The flesh dries and cracks from your face. You are disintegrating. The muscles of your limbs begin to flake away to the dust. You are disintegrating. Your belly splits open and your guts uncoil like snakes. You are disintegrating. Your ribs collapse onto shriveled lungs and heart. You are disintegrating. All that you ever did and all that you ever were become nothing. You are disintegrating. You can remember nothing of who you were. Your mind is blank. Reclose your vital force with 
with the mind and personality and the memory until you are whole again. Facing the trap door. The trap door closes silently back into the floor, covering the pit and opening the way forward. Step over the closed trap door and proceed along the passageway. You come to a halt in front of the final door at the end of the passageway. This door bears an egg-shaped design which sparkles with a thousand colors. This is the temple of illumination. Visualize an eight-rayed star of chaos onto the metal disc on the door. The door swings silently and slowly inwards. Enter the temple to find it lit by a sparkling radiance from the multifaceted crystal walls. The room is empty save for yourself, yet any instruments you may require will appear on command. In this temple, perform whatever acts of illumination you have willed.
prepare to leave the temple of illumination. As you pass out of the door, it closes behind you. Continue down the passageway. Step over the closed trapdoor to the pit. Pass the doors of the temples of enchantment and invocation. Continue and pass the doors of the temples of evocation and divination. Ascend the passageway and pass out of the door by which you entered. Turn to face the door. It swings silently and slowly shut. Draw across the black veil bearing the eight-rayed star of chaos. The Thonos working is at an end. You are arrayed in your normal clothing. Arise and go forth.